Okay, so uh, let's go over a couple things. Um, first and foremost, I'm going to, before we even get into the focus question today, I want to oversimplify the lesson from yesterday, spend a minute just kind of talking about certain things, and then I want to uh, open it up to questions because I really don't want to get into today's assignment um, without making sure we're, we're clear on yesterday. Um, I saw about 40 students did it, so most of you guys are in pretty good shape. Um, which is good, but ultimately I want to, uh, you know, give you an opportunity here if you have any questions. So let's go back for a second. Um, let's oversimplify. Hold on one sec. You guys need me? Oh yeah, sure. All right. So we wrapped up World War II. That was the first thing we did. Um, the United States and the Soviet Union definitely are in the best shape in terms of the power of the countries at this point. Um, you're going to learn today Germany separating into West Berlin and East, excuse me, West Germany and East Germany becomes rather important. Um, and uh, we talked about the armies getting desegregated. We then went on explaining what a Cold War was. The Cold War had nothing to do with the fact that it was cold out, you know, in the Soviet Union. It has to do with the fact that there was um, no fighting between the two major countries. So the United States and Soviet Union will threaten each other a lot. There'll be a huge issue with um, a lot of the countries that are involved, but ultimately there is no actual fighting between the two countries. All right, tomorrow is an example, like we'll look at the Korean War. Um, the Korean War does, has to do with communism, has to do with the United States and the Soviet Union, but there's no direct fighting between the United States and the Soviet Union. So we'll talk about what that means. All right, then we looked at a map, okay, which we'll go to in a little bit later. And then we got into the differences between the United States and the Soviet Union. And um, we, we should know a lot of these already. America's capitalist and has the democracy and republic. Soviet Union's more authoritative and is a communist country. And uh, we talked about the role of how people in the United States have rights and the government's not supposed to infringe on those. Okay, we have our freedoms. Soviet Union, in terms of government control, will look a lot more like the so uh, the Soviet Union will look a lot more like Germany, as opposed to um, the United States. So they have a lot more control. You can't really speak out, and we talked about the gulags. So that was Mr. Panu oversimplified for the last ninety seconds. Before we go on to today's lesson, do we have any questions besides Abigail who has one? Um, on um, the notes, we were talking about how the, I think the army got desegregated. Yes. Was that only for the army or for like the whole world as a Great whole? Question. Uh, oh, not, it was just for the United States Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, just, you know, ours, but it wasn't just the army. I guess I should have been more clear on that. Not just the, mil not just the army services, the, mil the military in general. That's a really good question. Maheen, what's your question? Okay, so gulags are like concentration camps. I would say they're like concentration camps, but the concentration camp goal was to eventually kill out all of the Jewish people in terms of the Holocaust. The gulags are not necessarily like that. The gulags are basically going to prison. But instead of a prison, like in the United States, where you go and serve time in jail, you go and you serve time as a worker. So you go to like the fields or you go to the, to the quarry and you work there. And they're not trying to kill you in the Soviet Union. But we'd be remiss to say that, you know, you see close to 2 million people died in the gulags for a 25 year, 30 year span. Um, Obviously, they weren't the best conditions, all right? Were they going to line you up and shoot you like they did in Germany, in Nazi Germany? No. Were they going to overwork you and you get very tired and can you get sick and can you maybe die that way? Yes. Um, so are they like concentration camps? Are they as bad? No. Are they like internment camps? Kind of, but not nearly. Like internment camps, no Japanese people are going to be dying in. Um, it wasn't pleasure, you know, it wasn't a pleasant thing being in a tournament camp. So in the past two weeks, you guys have learned uh, gulags, concentration camps, and internment camps. They're all kind of similar, but all kind of different too. So it's a good question. Any other questions before we move on? One once, going twice. All right, let's move on. 
So now we are going to shift our focus from World, um, World War II to, now I gotta say, at home, our country is, is very, very happy. Things are going well. You're gonna learn how our country and our economy booms a little bit later. But we immediately go right into the notion like, okay, we want to be much more involved on the world scale. Because remember, before World War I, America was very, new, you know, very, very not involved. Um, before World War II, we had a policy, a foreign policy of isolationism. And you know what? That foreign policy led us to some problems because eventually Hitler and eventually Japan just started growing and becoming more powerful. So now we want to change our foreign policy and we want to now become what's called a containment foreign policy. Okay, so let me read to you what a definition is, but if you know what a container does, and if you know what it means to contain, it's actually very straightforward. So the Soviet's foreign policy, let's talk about theirs, was to spread communism around the world and um, essentially cut off democracy from entering any part of Asia. And what they called it was they wanted to descend what's called an iron curtain. So I'm going to go back to this map here. Okay, pretty much they wanted to continue to grow south and they wanted to grow west, okay? They wanted all of Asia to be communist, okay? So this would become an important thing when we look at places like Vietnam and Korea, a little foreshadowing if you know a little American history. And then they also want to take over parts of Eastern Europe, which they do without a problem. Now, I don't do a great job explaining this, but after the Nazis beat Germany in World War II, as they're returning home, they literally start taking over countries around there. So they start taking over Ukraine, Belarus, Romania, Albania, um, I believe Poland. Okay, those countries are now going to become a part of the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union, if you could follow my mouse, used to just be, you know, this massive country here. But now they've, you know, almost doubled in size. because They've taken over a lot of uh, Eastern European countries. Okay, so their foreign policy was to spread communism. Our foreign policy was the opposite. We wanted to what's called contain foreign, uh, contain um, communism. So it's a policy to stop the spread of Soviet communism around the world. Now, I want you to think back when we talked about the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln. Stopping slavery and stopping the spread of slavery were two completely different things. Okay. Abraham Lincoln wanted to stop the spread of slavery. So if you remember, in the South that they had slaves, Lincoln let them know, like, hey, we're not going to bother you if you have slaves. Okay, if you're a border state, we're not going to uh, bother you if you have slaves. But we just don't want it to spread. Truman's going to do the same thing just with communism. So if you go to the red countries, and they are communists right now, like, Soviet, like Russia, like the Soviet Union, like China, like Manchuria, these countries that are communists get to stay communist. We're not going to bother them. We're not going to try and, you know, invade those countries for being communists. We're going to let them be. But our policy is containment. So we don't want any of these countries here in white, any of these countries in blue, okay, which is more capitalist and, and democratic. We don't want those countries to become communist. Okay. So under the foreign policy of containment, okay, this is something that we're going to look at. Yes, Denise, go ahead. Uh, I don't understand the comparison between Abraham Lincoln and Truman, because like slavery, um, ending the slap of slavery, like was not, was like a good thing for like America, but like stopping like communism, I don't, know, I don't think they're similar at all. And like comparing like ending slavery to like ending the spread of communism sounds like kind of like kind of like trying to glorify in some way, where, like. It could be glorified, but like comparing the two are like not like similar at all. Like, okay, um, I would definitely just not go over. I'm trying to draw a comparison of just like, hey, you know how something sometimes you want to go in and stop an issue from actually happening and then stopping the spread. In this case, like, there's two parts of communism like throughout the Cold War where we're just trying to stop the spread of it, and then we want to go and like stop communism in general. So this is just the part of it that we're just trying to stop the spread. I'm not really comparing slavery to communism. I'm just comparing that there's policies that you try and stop, and then you also stop the spread of. In this case, we're just trying to stop the spread. That's all I'm trying to, to make the point of. All right. The primary goal of the United States foreign policy of containment was to what? Two, 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 two. 
Okay, sounds like ballerinas. You guys are good. Yeah, stop communist influence from spreading. So containment, okay, making sure that you know it has to do with communism and from spreading is very important. Now, that is the main foreign policy. What we're going to look at is after the main foreign policy, okay, we're going to look at um, the laws and the smaller policies that were under containment. So the first one we're gonna look at is something called the Truman Doctrine. So if you think of containment as the big foreign policy, it's called an umbrella policy, meaning that this is you know, the big thing that everything is under. So the Truman Doctrine is a smaller foreign policy under the larger idea of containment. So take a minute and copy this down. There's like three more slides, but they're all kind of short like this. All right, so let's get this one down. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward, okay? And since containment is all about stopping communism from spreading around the world, uh, the first thing that makes the most sense is we want to take an opportunity where there is a, basically a communist country trying to go and take over a um, non-communist country, okay? Now, there's going to be a couple of instances like this, but for this particular situation, Okay, let's say a country, the biggest one is right now, you see in the, the paper here is, um, there's a communist country of Turkey who sent troops into Greece to try and take over Greece and basically have them be more um, communist. They take them over so Greece becomes communist and a part of Turkey, okay? Whenever a situation like that happens, we're no longer gonna sit on the sidelines and let this happen. So the second any communist country wants to take over a smaller country, we're going to send economic aid, okay? We're going to send military aid. Now, sometimes we're just going to send money, okay? Like in this case here between uh, Turkey and Greece, these two countries here, we sent $400 million, okay, to, um, to Greece to help them out in their fight against Turkey. And this money was very crucial in helping them out. Now, later on tomorrow, you're going to see a very similar situation in Korea where we're not just going to send money, but we're also going to send troops. Okay, but we'll talk all about that tomorrow. So anytime there is an issue between um, a communist country and a non-communist country, we're going to help out the country that is obviously non-communist. And this is a great example between Turkey and Greece here. So... Under the policy of containment, we want to make sure that we step up and do this. Now, World War II, if you remember, the big reason why, I guess, Hitler um, had so much success early on taking over and invading countries like Austria and Czechoslovakia is no country stepped up to stop them. We saw our mistakes from World War II and said, okay, we don't want a repeat of that to happen. So if there's an invasion, if there's a, a military problem between these two countries, we want to step up and help out. Okay, so the way we do this with Greece and Turkey is sending 400 million. Write in the chat, please, if you need more time. Abigail does. If you can be one of the kind, kind uh, students to also put in the chat to help your classmates out, that would be great. Lena, thank you so much. I'll give everyone another 10 more seconds. Okay, let's try this one. In the Truman Doctrine, in the Truman Doctrine, President Harry Truman pledged to what? Okay, one, 
support Greece in its fight against communist aggression. Guys, you could change any any country. You could say support uh, South Korea in its fight against communist aggression. If it's it's against communism, we're going to help them out by sending them money or sending them military aid. Okay. So after the Truman Doctrine, a year later, we're going to take it a step further. So still under the policy or the umbrella of containment, we're going to look at something called the Marshall Plan. Okay, this is a law that was designed by not by Harry Truman, but someone that works in his cabinet, the Secretary of State. So take a minute and copy this down. Okay, so when World War II ends, this is just a friendly reminder, okay? America had no fighting in World War II in their home country besides Pearl Harbor and a couple of very small skirmishes out on the West Coast. Um, there was really no damage. And our economy, because we spent so many people, you know, getting to work in terms of, you know, preparing for World War II, our economy was booming, okay? Our economy is doing really, really well. We actually had so much money that we actually... Not that we didn't know what to do with it sort of thing, but like we had like all of this money and we wanted to use that in terms of helping out uh, countries. Okay, so this is sometimes known as foreign aid. This has become a, a bigger thing in American politics in the last 20 and 30 years, but this is like the first time we're really, you know, focus on what's called foreign aid. So what we're gonna do is very simple. The Marshall Plan was trying to look at the countries that were hit the hardest from World War II um, let's see a good example. Uh, Italy is a good example. You know, Belgium's a good example. France is a good example. Um, out in Western Europe, where their economy was just crushed, their country was crushed from World War II. Um, so what we want to do is we want to help out the countries that are struggling and poor right now in the late 1940s. And the way we're going to do this is, number one, giving money. That does help. Okay, we're going to give foreign aid, it's called. We're also wanting to go in and help rebuild their economies, create factories, create railroads, things along those lines to help out the countries there. And the idea was this, if a country is wealthy and a country is successful and a country does well, there's not a great chance that a communism can come in and take over. Communists can come in and take over. Communism is more likely to arise in poor countries. Okay, we talked about this during the Roaring Twenties, but this is just a reminder, okay? Communism stems from the fact that if people are poor and struggling and they're not making a lot of money, but they're looking at people or you know, country, you know, businesses that are making a lot of money, there becomes this issue where like, okay, well, why do they make so much money and I make practically nothing? You know, maybe we should try and change that around and everyone makes the same sort of thing. Um, so it's a more appealing idea when you're, you're poor and struggling. Okay, you know, if you're doing well, it's not as appealing as ideal. All right. All right, same thing. If anyone wants to post in the chat, if you still need more time, otherwise I would like to move on. Sanjita, thank you for that one. All right, which statement about the Marshall Plan is most accurate? Someone be brave. Which statement about the Marshall Plan is most accurate? I got a three with a question mark and then I got a whole bunch of other threes. Yes, it is. It was used to be re rebuild European nations after World War II. Okay, that is correct. All right, now let's set this stage up a little bit for an issue that's gonna happen out in Berlin, Germany, which for those that don't know is the capital. So we have two, two maps here, okay? Map number one on the left here is a map of Europe in 1947. And what you'll notice is Germany is no longer Germany. 
Okay, we talked about this. They are now West Germany and East Germany. They are not really an independent country. They are really babysat by four countries, four countries to look after them. Okay, so what I now want us to do is now that you have a map of Europe, take a look here on the map to the right. Okay, and in West Germany, okay, the yellow country over here, it's going to be broken up into three sectors. Okay, West Germany is going to be uh, held by Great Britain in the green. Um, you're going to have in the yellow, the southern part of West Germany, you're going to have the United States. And then you're also going to have on the west here, you're going to have France taking control of that area. Okay? In the east, okay, the Soviet Union is going to control that. Now, very basic. West Germany is capitalist, is democratic, and looks a lot more like the United States. East Germany is what, you think, guys? If East Germany is owned by the Soviet Union, what government are they going to have? Good. Communist. Okay, they're going to have a communist government. So even yes, though... They, yes, the government isn't communist. It's like it has a totalitarian system. That's the economy, not the... Not well, the government form. My mistake, yes. So communist is going to be the economy. All right, the totalitarianism is going to be from the Soviet Union, and East Germany is going to be kind of the same thing. So yes, you're correct in the terms of the economy. So same thing. In the United States, they're going to be a capitalist country, and so is this West Germany. Thank you for correcting that. Okay, now, in East Germany, in East Germany, you have Berlin, the capital of what used to be Germany. So they decided at the Yalta conference to basically separate Berlin as well into four different sectors. So if we zoom in now to Berlin, which if you guys, you guys can see my mouse over here, we zoom into over here, you're gonna notice it looks very similar, okay? So if you go into the capital of Berlin, okay, you're going to have the southern part of Berlin owned by the United States, um, the western part of West Berlin owned by Great Britain, and then the northern part owned by France. East Berlin is going to be owned by the Soviet Union. Okay, so not only was Germany divided, but so was their capital. So here comes an issue that's going to happen out in Berlin that gets very tricky and gets one of the real first tense moments of the Cold War. So let's talk about and set up the scenario. All right, I'll give you a minute to copy this down. This is known as the Berlin Airlift. Okay, and this is a conflict that arises. So take a minute and copy this. Okay, so not to oversimplify the situation, but basically the Soviet Union, they blockaded, okay, West Berlin from the United States. Okay, so if you go back to here, what you'll notice is, okay, I know you're not done copying, what you'll notice is Berlin is located in East Germany. So we're not really allowed to kind of just walk to East Germany, but we were allowed to go into Berlin. So we had a good uh, relationship where we can go into Berlin if we wanted to you know, work with the people there. But in 1948, they're going to block us from coming in. All right? Um, so I wanted to add something here. It's not for you guys uh, being, but not given supplies. Okay. All right, while that's going on, the people of West Berlin were really not getting the supplies and the food that they needed. So a lot of the people in West Berlin, like, were hungry, were starving sort of thing. So 
they called on the United States and Britain to help. Okay, so there's this really weird situation where we can't go into East Germany because that would be considered like an act of war, but we also want to help our people in West Berlin. So there's this really interesting situation that, as you can imagine, there is obviously air travel at this time and planes that pass through. So there's this like kind of weird thing where we're allowed to fly through Okay, we're allowed to fly through Berlin. Okay, we're allowed to fly over Soviet Union, but we're not really allowed to walk through it. Okay, if that makes any sense. All right, so what we're going to end up doing is a loophole. And it's a little bit crafty, but it's definitely a little bit risky. So the idea came from the United States government this time. So, okay, the people of Berlin need supplies. We can't walk it through. So what if we kind of just fly over, um, what if we kind of just fly over West Berlin and as we're flying by, we kind of just drop the supplies they need and continue to fly on. We're not really breaking any terms of any treaties. Um, we usually, we fly over it anyway. And um, yeah, let's see what they do. All right. So, Sorry, I have a typo here. So I just fixed this slide up a little bit before. I just didn't uh, proofread it. So try and help the test for West Berliner. Sorry about that. Um, so in 1948, for the first time, we fly over West Berlin and we start dropping some supplies on them. And uh, the people are able to get to them and people are able to get what they need. This is known as the Berlin Airlift. Yeah, Abigail, there probably is. We'll talk about the Berlin Wall a little bit later on. Okay, the Soviets were obviously not happy about this because we did kind of go against the loophole a little bit. Okay, it definitely was a loophole, but ultimately they didn't respond with force. So even though they were threatening us, this is a lot of what the Cold War is, a lot of threatening, a lot of like, oh, if you do this, we're gonna you know, bomb you sort of thing. They threatened us, but we were in a tough situation. We wanted our people that we are allies with in West Berlin we want to make sure that they are a responsibility and that they're well taken care of. So we ended up responding this way and it ended up being, I think, the perfect measure because the Soviets never really responded with force. A few years later, though, they're going to create something called the Berlin Wall. Okay. Um, the Berlin Wall was like a kind of response that came later. And what it did was it separated East and West Berlin. Okay, it separated East and West Berlin at this point, and uh, this would last until 1989. Now, we'll talk about the Berlin Wall a little, little bit later on in this class, but this is just the start of it being created. And um, it's a really sad thing when, when we look at the picture in a second, but basically, um, try and picture a wall that would separate, you know, the West and the Eastern part of the Bronx. People had family out in East Berlin. People in, you know, had family out in West Berlin. And when that wall went up, guys, you were not ever seeing them. Okay, this wall lasted for about 40 years and you were not allowed to enter from West Berlin to East Berlin for anything. The wall was created, okay, um, to keep the people in East Berlin in there. Plain and simple, they were not allowed to leave. Okay? Um, if you guys have a, if you guys can, you need to put it in the chat, please do. Otherwise, I want to move on to these pictures. All right. So, you know, this is a, this is the Berlin Wall a little bit later on. Okay. This is the Berlin Wall, like, you know, a little bit later on, both of the pictures here. But if you look kind of in the middle, um, do you guys know what would happen if you tried to climb over this wall and run across? Do you guys, I'm not sure if you guys have seen that or know what would happen. You would get shot. Abigail's correct. Okay, there were people, there were always guards from uh, the Soviet Union, from East Berlin, that would not allow you to try and escape out of East Berlin. Okay, so you would get shot and killed on the spot. You are not allowed to over and pass through. So I just wanted to make that very clear. All right. So this was, you know, a good example 
of the authoritarianism, you know, within the Soviet Union, where you're not really allowed to go against what they said. East Berlin's the Soviet, yes. Anything that's east is closer to the Soviet Union. So East Germany, East Berlin, that is the Soviet Union. That is correct. Thanks, Lena, again, I appreciate it. All right, so we'll talk about the Berlin Wall a little bit more, um, but the main goal of the Berlin Wall was not necessarily necessarily to keep people out, okay, from coming, I shouldn't say that. The main goal of the Berlin Wall was not necessarily to keep people from coming into East Berlin, okay, like many walls, like even the Trump Wall with Mexico, that was meant to keep, you know, illegal immigrants from coming into the United States. The Berlin Wall was made to basically make sure the people of East Berlin did not leave. Now, we'll talk about some reasons why some people from East Berlin wanted to leave a little bit later on, but this is just something that I think you guys should be aware of. Last slide for today before you guys get a few minutes for the homework assignment. Okay, this one's very straightforward. Okay, we're obviously not done with Harry Truman as a president yet, okay? Um, the president after him is, the, is Dwight D. Eisenhower, who we'll talk about more, especially when we get to the civil rights movement. But he is a former uh, military commander general of D-Day, um, and he obviously gets elected president, um, very well liked. And um, his focus, when he came into power with the Cold War, is something called the Eisenhower Doctrine, which is like the Truman Doctrine, like very similar, the only difference is it changes the part of the world we focus on. We go from focusing on, you know, preventing things in Europe to the Eisenhower doctrine where he's going to um, focus on helping the Middle East. The Middle East are countries like Pakistan, um, Yemen, Afghanistan, countries along those lines um, that are a little bit closer to the Soviet Union. All right. And the Middle East is where some issues start to happen you know, in the world in the 1960s and 70s. So his policy is to try and prevent that from happening. All right. So the Truman Doctrine and Eisenhower Doctrine. Okay. Basically the same, just different areas. Sorry, sorry, sorry. All right, so one of the pitfalls of this lesson is I give you like four or five terms, okay, between the Eisenhower Doctrine and the Marshall Plan, and it can certainly get confusing. So. What I definitely want to do for the last few minutes and into your homework assignment for today. Um, one second. Thanks, Noreen. Appreciate you guys' help and helping out your classmates like that. All right, sorry, I just had a reload page. Internet's a little slow. Okay. So we have some early Cold War review questions, which is weird because we've only been on this for about two periods. But I think it's important that we, we make sure and you guys make sure you guys have a, a good understanding before we start moving on because it's foundation for a lot of things we'll talk about over the next few weeks. Okay, so answer question one, that is from yesterday's lesson. So go back to your notes from yesterday's lesson to help out with question one. Same thing with question two, okay, also from yesterday's lesson. Okay. Um, Pretty much all the things here, I'm going to ask you guys to not copy and paste from your notes, please. Questions three and four. Try and put this into your own words, not the words that you wrote down from the notes, but please put this into your own words. Tell me in your own words what containment's about. Tell me in your own words what the Marshall Plan, the Truman Doctrine, the Eisenhower Doctrine are all about. Okay? 
Last question you do is an opinion question. What is your opinion on containment? Should America be intervening with other countries around the world? Why or why not? It's obviously an opinion question, so you don't have to go crazy with it, but um, you know, let me know your thoughts. Okay, because there are some pros and cons when you're more involved on the world stage uh, like the United States is at this point. All right, no one go anywhere for the last four minutes. I just have to copy down, I'm um, sorry, I have to do attendance. Four is already answered. So yeah, no, again, Tian, just put them into your own words, yeah. I wouldn't write the definitions that I gave you, just put it into your own words. Synthesize it in a way that you're trying to explain to a younger brother or sister. That's the way it explains. Like, how would you explain this to, you know, someone who's never been in social studies before? Okay, guys, I have attendance taken. So I imagine this will take you just a few more minutes. Just finish it up for homework. Um, I updated your grades. I updated the test grades, too, for the classwork grades, the test grades. So take a look at Jupiter. If you have any questions, let me know. I will see you all next time. Have a good one.